colorful gangland life deserves a colorful funeral. And if the gangster goes to the great beyond in a diamond-encrusted casket, accompanied by shouts of Viva Mafia Viva, well, all the better, surely. The mob reporter here with the behind-the-scenes story of the life spectacularly messy death and the wild send-off of a gangster drug lord with a special guest who's on the ground in South Africa. Yaganatham Pele is better known by his nickname Teddy Mafia. From his home in a suburb of Durban, the third most populous city in South Africa, Teddy Mafia became a legendary figure, beloved by many in the community, where he had a fiercely loyal base of support, built old school, like the traditional mafiosi of old. As a reputed drug lord and gang boss, he was, in at least one sense, South Africa's version of John Gotti, a Teflon Don against whom criminal charges didn't stick. But this week, Teddy learned that gangland rivals can be a more treacherous adversary than prosecutors. He was murdered in his home in a shock attack. And then something else remarkable happened. An angry mob caught and killed his alleged attackers in the street outside. To learn more about Teddy Mafia and what happened, I reached out to Oren Singh, a crime reporter in Durban with South Africa's Times Live and the Sunday Times. Oren has been closely watching the fallout from this gangland murder. Welcome to the Mob Reporter. Oren, can you tell us why he is known as Teddy Mafia? So, Teddy Mafia's real name is Yaganathan Pele. Um, he's 62 years old. Um, he's a father and a grandfather. His name, from what I understand, was derived in the early, his early days in, in gangsterism. There was a gang known as the Mafias um, in the 80s and the early 90s that really um, ruled with an iron fist in the Shellcross area. Um, and I believe that's where Teddy's, Teddy Mafia's name derived from, from the gang that he actually was part of. What do you know about his early years? Um, he dropped out of school as early as grade eight, um, and he uh, began working, and this was in order to support his family. And uh, he got his first job at a shoe factory. A friend who's known him for more than about 40 years told me that Teddy always loved money. He always loved making money. He was very business-minded. And so he began a small operation from his flat in Shellcross, where he started selling liquor and alcohol. And, um, and that kind of grew over the years. After alcohol, he began, uh, you know, dealing in a little bit of marijuana here and there. And thereafter, he decided to get into hard drugs or allegedly started getting into harder drugs and dealing. And that's where he built his empire. That's how he started his empire from uh, a, a small scale alcohol distribution area from his home um, to this to this massive drug empire that that he's said to have, have been sitting on top of the throne of. I understand he had a deep connection with the community around him in Durban. I wouldn't say the larger Durban area, but in a community called Shellcross, which is just south of Durban. And, um, and he's quite known and revered in the community, but more than revered, I'd say he's, he's actually seen as, what would, I, what would I say? He's actually seen as a saint. Um, he does a lot of charity for the people. He has helped schools, churches, temples. So he's seen as a sort of Robin Hood sort of character in the sense that, you know, he gives a lot to the poor. But in the same token, in the same breath, he's not stealing from the rich. He, to an extent, he's stealing from the rich, but also stealing from the poor. Now tell us how he died. So his death this week, and I think the manner and just, and the sequence of events in, in the manner in which how things unfolded and just the gruesome and horrific scenes that played out in this affluent community in, in Durban um, on Monday literally took South Africa by shock. The two men that were at his home on Monday were actual friends or acquaintances of Teddy. Uh, Teddy had actually instructed one of his drivers or one of his guys to go and pick up these two gentlemen um, from a hospital that's not too far away from his home, known as RK Khan Hospitals. And, um, and upon picking them up, they brought them back to the house. They were meant to be having some sort of business deal or conversation. 
Uh, but Teddy had been expecting them throughout the day and had made his family known that these guys are going to be coming to the house and, you know, just expect them. And we've got some business to discuss. And so when they did eventually arrive, Teddy and these two gentlemen walked down to his, into his garage and they, they started discussing their business there. His daughter had just left and um, had been walking up the stairs into his home when she heard a gunshot ring off. And she turned around and ran back down and she sees her father sitting on a seat uh, with a gunshot wound. And these two men turned looking at him and they tell her, we didn't do it, we didn't do it. And from that point onward, um, things get a bit murky. But all we know is fast forward a couple of minutes and an angry mob descends upon Teddy's home. And these men are subsequently shot from what our sources tell us. Um, they're then decapitated in broad daylight in the middle of the road. And then their bodies are piled up onto a pile of tires with twigs and sticks and set alight. From what his brother tells me, he was shot twice. And his brother says that it seems as if he tried to defend himself because he was shot once in the hand and it seemed that he tried to grab the barrel of a gun. And he was shot in the hand and then shot just above his right eye in the forehead. Um, and then the scenes played out, those gory scenes played out on Taurus Street, um, on the corner of Tory Street and Table Mountain Street in Shellcross. You were at Teddy Mafia's funeral. It looks a pretty wild affair. Tell us about what it was like. Well, I was at the funeral. It was, it was elaborate to say the least, but you wouldn't expect anything less from some from some woman of his of his stature within the community. Um, I think under COVID regulations, uh, the law permits us under currently under lockdown level three, not more than 50 people to be attending a funeral service um, at any specific point in time. And there's more than 50 people gathered on his street. It's safe to say that law enforcement officials had they, they were cut out for them on the day. There was a strong police presence there on the day. They had a big screen TV outside and they were broadcasting live footage from inside the home. Um, so obviously Teddy's, Terry, Teddy's casket uh, came down. It was a, a diamond encrusted casket um, made up of fake diamonds. The funeral procession was led by a Rolls Royce, a white Rolls Royce and a Scotsman playing a bagpipe in the front. That's what was the whole funeral procession coming down the road. His body was carried into the home um, and his family obviously grieved. A lot of people wanting to enter the home and police had to intervene and eventually disperse people. Teddy's body was then carried out by his pallbearers and rested in front of his home. Seven white doves were then let loose. His body was then picked up on the shoulders of his pallbearers and, and carried up uh, Table Mountain Street, the infamous paper, Table Mountain Street. His body was carried up. I'm not too sure how far up ahead they went before putting it into the funeral or the hearse. That's a that's a gangster's or a gangster's funeral in a nutshell, I suppose. Have theories emerged on who was behind the hit? From what we understand, Teddy, being a, a suspected drug kingpin, uh, would have had a lot of enemies. Um, but from what his brother tells me, a lot of his enemies were also some of his closest friends. Leading into the cliche um, statement, as you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So, so there's been this level of, of, of animosity and anger within this community of, of Chatsworth and Shalkov for, for over a year. And that's, that's based on the fact that there's been seven murders committed within these communities since December 2019. Um, three of these murders, or we can say four, are close friends and relatives of Teddy Mafia. Um, the last murder that was committed, or well, the second, the, the fourth to last was his son. His son was gunned down in a drive-by shooting in March last year. And prior to that, Teddy had lost a friend who stayed on his road that um, had a liquor, uh, a tavern, what we call a tavern. And he was killed in a drive-by shooting just a month prior to that. After, after Teddy's son is murdered in a drive-by shooting, there's at least three or four other mur murders that, are, that take place within this community and the surrounding areas that are all, all believed to be related 
to this drug feud and this turf war going on in the area. Teddy Mafia seems to have been South Africa's own Teflon Don. What can you tell us about his legal track record? His cases are about 12, dating back to 1993. And of those 12 cases, he was found guilty of one. And that case he was found guilty of was being in possession of drugs. And that was as far back as, as 1995, I think. He was found guilty of that offense. He was sentenced to a fine of 1,500 rand and 60 hours community service. The 11 other cases were either withdrawn against him or he was not found guilty in those cases. Between 2013 and 2016, during three raids at his home, drugs amounting to the value of 23 million rand were confiscated at his home, as well as uh, cash, illegal firearms, uh, illegal ammunition, and gold coins. He had been arrested on so many occasions and yet never convicted. Um, one out of 12, one out of 12. Some people actually said that he, he worked with impunity um, and that uh, police did nothing to stop him. I guess it's just what happens. Um, it happens not only in our country, but all over the world, that uh, known drug dealers are allegedly in cahoots with police and senior officials. And I'm not saying that's the case here, but it certainly looks like it by the way things have played out. Uh, Warren, thank you very much for taking the time to bring us up to speed on this uh, interesting case, and I'm sure you'll be chasing it for some time to come. Thank you for your time. And thank you for watching.